Good morning, everybody. And uh, this morning we continue our series in the uh, book of Galatians that we've been studying for the uh, um, past two weeks. And uh, the theme that we're following is that uh, is believers set free. And today's uh, passage or today's theme is believers set free from fear. So we're going to look at uh, Galatians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. And uh, in this passage, uh, the Apostle Paul recounts a further visit that he made to Jerusalem uh, to discuss with the Jerusalem church, with the apostles there, uh, controversies, disputes that were uh, uh, causing issues and dividing the early church. So let's uh, look at the passage then. Um, um, Galatians chapter 2, I'm going to read verses 1 to 10. Fourteen years later, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation and set before them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. But I did this privately to those who seemed to be leaders, for fear that I was running or had run my race in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false brothers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might remain with you. As for those who seem to be important, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not judge by external appearance. Those men added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they saw that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, just as Peter had been to the Jews. For God, who was at work in the ministry of Peter as an apostle to the Jews, was also at work in my ministry as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Peter, and John those reputed to be pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the Jews. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. So then let's look at the background to this passage in the book of Galatians. So we began studying this book two weeks ago, and as I said, in uh, chapter two, Paul recounts a further visit that he made to the apostles in Jerusalem to deal with theological issues that had been causing difficulties in the early church. There were a group of false teachers called Judaizers who were telling the church in Galatia that the gospel preached by Paul was incomplete. And they were claiming these false teachers that they represented the apostles in Jerusalem. As I said, these people were known as Judaizers. And what they were trying to do was they were trying to impose the Mosaic law, that is the Jewish law given to Moses uh, um, hundreds of years earlier, thousands of years earlier. They were trying to impose the Jewish law on the Gentile believers in Christ. So Paul had been going through the uh, Roman world, preaching the gospel to Gentile believers, that is the non-Jewish world, and converting many to Christ. And these uh, false teachers were upsetting the believers in the churches that Paul had established. They were telling these Gentile believers that to be a Christian, you must first become a Jew and follow Jewish law, and only then could you become a Christian. 
They were teaching a distorted truth that you can't come directly to Christ as a pagan Gentile. Now, Paul's calling was to, as an apostle to the Gentiles, as he, uh, um, we read there in the passage. Paul himself was a converted Jew, but his ministry was to Gentiles, non-Jews. Last week, when Ellen uh, recounted to us chapter one, Paul showed that he was independent from the other apostles. He had uh, received his commission from the Lord in a separate way. We recall how the Lord came to the apostle Paul on the road to Damascus. It was a dramatic conversion and, and uh, Jesus spoke to Paul directly through that bright light and told him that he must now follow him. He must follow Jesus and become a disciple of Jesus and preach the gospel, preach Jesus to the world. He received his message directly from God or he received the gospel uh, directly from God, but he preached the same gospel as the 12 apostles from the Jerusalem church. Now we know that Paul, after his conversion, made at least four visits to Jerusalem and this appears to be a follow-up visit. And he says that on this visit, he took two of his co-workers with him, Barnabas, who was a Jew, and Titus, who was a Gentile. And he presents to the church in Jerusalem, to the apostles there, he said privately, so to a very small group, probably just those who were the apostles composed of, of Jesus's followers um, um, during Jesus' ministry. He presents to them the gospel that he has been preaching to the Gentiles. And he says that he, he, he did this because he was afraid that the race that he was running was in vain. Paul was concerned. He wasn't concerned about the validity of the gospel because he was sure of the message. He had received the message directly from Jesus himself, but he was concerned about its practical outworking. The gospel that Paul preached needed to be preached in conjunction with the, with the Jerusalem church, they shouldn't, there, there should be no division in the message that they were preaching. And so to describe his fears in the passage that we read, Paul uses the illustration of an athletics race. Paul knew that he would complete his leg of the race, but that he also needed to be sure that the other disciples were, were carrying their part of the baton uh, in the race. Otherwise, his efforts would be wasted and the church would never make it to the finish line. The church needed to be united in message for the church to be successful and grow. And the essence was this, is the gospel for everyone? The Judaizers were causing conflict by cut by, by spreading a different message to the early Christians. And Paul knew that if the apostles in Jerusalem didn't help him in correcting this false teaching, then his race could be run in vain. These false teachers had the potential to ruin the missionary efforts where Paul was seeing great efforts in the, in the Gentile churches. So Paul must agree with the Jerusalem disciples and firmly establish that the gospel is for everybody. The freedom of these new Christians was under attack. And the apostle Paul was determined not to let his enemies take away the freedom that his gentle, Gentile converts enjoyed. So there was much at stake here. Spiritual freedom was being threatened by these Judaizers, 
the false teachers. And so it's important that we study this controversy so that no one should say to us that the gospel is not for all people. Let's look at the essential message of the gospel. The Judaizers were saying that Gentile believers had to be circumcised, had to become Jewish in order to be truly saved. So they were adding an element of, of human works to the gospel. And Paul resisted that, this. And he says that he, he explained the gospel, his gospel to the church in Jerusalem that what the Judaizers were saying was not true. And they agreed with him. He says that not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. A Greek. According to the gospel, we are free from working for salvation. It's a gospel of grace. We are saved through faith in Jesus. We don't have to earn our salvation. It's a gift from God. And the words free and the concept of freedom are key words in, in the book of Galatians. They occur 11 times throughout the book. So Paul is addressing disputes that had arisen in the, in the early church. He says that these false brothers, so they claimed to be Christians, they had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ and to make us slaves. So they were people, that the false teachers that were going through the Gentile ch churches and contradicting what Paul was preaching. Paul uses military language. He says that they infiltrated our ranks. They claimed to be brothers, to be Christians, but they were false. They were really spies who wanted to take away the freedom of the Gentile believers. And Paul rejects their message and the changes that they want to introduce. And he stands firm on this point. And I think that's a, that's a lesson to us that where the gospel is threatened, where basic Christian teaching is threatened, we should stand firm on the point. The Jewish law was not wrong because God had given it to the Jews. But here's the essential point. It was wrong to make following the law a requirement for salvation. Jewish Christians were free to follow the law. Gentile Christians were free to not follow the law. So Paul was fighting for their spiritual liberty. In the passage in Galatians 2.1, we read, 14 years later, so Paul had made a, a visit to, to Jerusalem 14 years earlier. We think that's the Jerusalem Council where these issues were debated and agreed among the apostles. But the controversy continued. And so Paul makes a return visit 14 years later uh, to go over the same point and to agree this with the apostles in, in Jerusalem. Paul mentions that he took Titus along with him to Jerusalem. And verse 3 tells us why he did that. Titus was a Gentile Christian, a Greek. And when you read the references that Paul makes of Titus in his letters, and the, <coughs> and the way he addresses him in the book of Titus. You can see that Titus was a faithful Christian. And Titus was an example to the church that the gospel is for, for all. He wasn't Jewish. He was Greek. He was a Gentile. But he was a faithful believer. And Paul was saying, look at Titus as an example follow Christ, you do not have to first become a Jew. You don't have to first become anything. You just come to Christ as you are. 
Titus demonstrated that a Gentile can become a Christian, and that's very important for, for us because nearly all of us, I would imagine, are Gentiles, non-Jews. So this is directly applicable to us. Anyone can come to Christ by grace through faith in Jesus. And Titus, through his life, through his ministry, was testimony of the fact that when you serve the Lord, it means more than just blessing your life. Other people are affected as well. God uses you to reach out to others. So the church needs more people like Titus. Paul says that he, he debated these issues with the apostles in Jerusalem 14 years earlier at what is called the Jerusalem Council. You can read it about it in Acts chapter 14. And what they agreed there at this council of the Jerusalem church was that, as, as we read in the passage, that Peter would become apostle to the Jewish, the Jewish world and that Paul would preach the gospel to the Gentiles. So there were two positive results from Paul's visit to Jerusalem. First of all, his, con his convert, Titus, a Gentile, was fully accepted as being a Christian. And then secondly, that his own commission to the Gentiles was acknowledged. The apostles saw Peter, saw Paul, as an equal partner in sharing the gospel. Peter would be an apostle to the Jews and Paul would be an apostle to the Gentiles. So there was diversity there. The church would preach to Jewish uh, people and also to non-Jewish people, but the message was the same. There was unity of message. Now let's, th let's think about these false teachers, these people who were dividing the church. What do you think was their motivation? Why do you think that they wanted to impose circumcision and other Jewish customs on the Gentile believers? Were they really motivated by a desire to please God? Or perhaps were they motivated by a desire to feel proud of obeying the law, of having the position of a, of a controlling judge. Perhaps they liked to control other people because it gave, that, gave them a sense of power and self-importance. And I think it's a warning to us, I, I, th I think, that perhaps there are people in our churches who like to control other people because it gives them a sense of power. Um, we might call them church police or legalists. Uh, there, are, there are things like traditional or contemporary music, differences in styles of worship that can cause disputes to, in, our, in our modern church. According to psychological studies, people who want to control others are afraid of losing power. They want to control all the situations that they find themselves in and dictate to other people how they should behave. They're the kind of people that plan and calculate and organize things rigorously. Perhaps they prefer to get their own way rather than be fair and equal to other people. They anticipate scenarios, how things work out, and if things don't go according to their plan, they feel anxious or angry. Sometimes they can be perfectionists. Perhaps they, they believe that people who don't think like them are simply wrong. Perhaps they're the kind of people that prefer to do things themselves because they don't want to, they don't trust other people. They think that they're going to mess it up. 
They don't trust other people or allow others to learn by making mistakes. They like to be, they like to criticize. They're inflexible. Perhaps they invade the privacy of other people. They like to generate dependency and have followers. So let's beware that we're not like that in our relationships with one another in the church. Because behind these people is a kind of fear. Just like the Jewish Pharisees, behind the control that they wanted to impose on others, they were afraid of uncertainty. They were afraid of losing power. And so they gave power to themselves by appearing to comply with the law because this gave them security and status. But they were not sincere in their hearts for we know that the Bible tells us that not one is righteous, not even one. And Jesus reserves some of his strongest condemnation for people like the Pharisees, calling them a race of vipers and whitewashed sepulchers. So uh, I think it's, it's, it's a warning to us to be flexible with others. And of course, the Apostle Paul knew all about people like this because he was once one of them. Paul was previously a man bound by the law, a slave to the law, but now he was a child of God. Who was Paul before meeting Jesus? And as Ellen outlined last week, Paul could outline his high credentials in Judaism. He was of Hebrew parents from the tribe of Benjamin. He was born in Tarsus, a very prosperous city in the Roman Empire. Paul had Roman citizenship, but he was also a Jew. He was circumcised on the eighth day, a sign of belonging to the people of God. He received an education in Jerusalem at the feet of the distinguished teacher, Gamaliel. And becoming a Pharisee, he was true to his Jewish principles and became one of the most ruthless persecutors of Christianity. And his life could only be transformed by turning 180 degrees when he had his personal encounter with Jesus. So with Paul, there was a definite before and after meeting Christ, his life was totally transformed. Paul writes in Galatians 5.1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. So stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. So Paul sets out the essence of the gospel that we are not saved by our works. Our works are insufficient to save us. It's through the redeeming death of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross that we are saved. Does this mean that good works are not important for Christians? No, we are saved by faith, but our faith should inspire us to do good works. Paul mentions that the apostles asked him to continue to remember the poor. They were referring to the poor believers of Jerusalem. And Paul says this was something that he was eager to do. So we are saved by faith, but that should inspire us to good works. So then to uh, bring this to a conclusion, Paul's interactions with the Judaizers perhaps gives us a guide as to how we should deal with differences in the church. When it comes to matters of defending the gospel, we must stand firm. But perhaps he's telling us that we must be flexible in matters of lesser importance. Paul makes a very strong statement in, in the passage that we read. He says that God is no respecter of a person's earthly status. 
God treats each of us equally. When we see the ministry of Jesus, we see him reaching out to people with the message of salvation, both men and women, children and the elderly, rich and poor, the wise and the demon-possessed, Jews and Gentiles, because God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save it through him, through Jesus. Jesus is the one who can give us salvation. He who believes in the Son of God will not be condemned, John 3, 14. So Paul served with the other, other apostles, with the rest of the church in spreading the gospel. We read that he had conflicts with some of the other leaders. And as long as we are on earth, we're not exempt from conflicts and differences either. But notwithstanding what uh, we read that we should stand firm with the truth of the gospel, we should seek to, 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 be, to, to live peaceably with our fellow Christians. In these times, it's important that we know the scriptures so that we won't be deceived by any worldly philosophy that seeks to insert itself into the church. We preach Christ the Savior. God has given us his word and his Holy Spirit to defend sound doctrine. So what happened to Paul after his encounter with Jesus? He affirms that everything that he achieved in the past, all those impeccable credentials that he listed, everything that he had achieved previously, I now consider like garbage, he says. He learned that his new identity as part of the body of Christ was truly glorious. He became an avid follower of Jesus. Preaching Jesus became his passion. He was able to say, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation of all who believe. The gospel has the power to transform our lives, to transform the lives of all the people around us in all the world. What did Paul find in Jesus that made him leave everything in his past? Paul found in Jesus true salvation, which set him free. This is what happened with Paul, the Pharisee of the Pharisees, the one who in human terms seemed to have everything in terms of his Jewish credentials. But when he met with Jesus, he realized that that was nothing. In Jesus, he really did have everything. It was like the parable that we read in Matthew chapter 13 about the pearl that was found. The merchant sold everything he had to have that precious pearl. God gave everything he loved, his son Jesus, to save us. And knowing him is like owning a treasure. Knowing Jesus is, opens a door opens doors for us that no one else can open because for him there is nothing that is impossible. Jesus is our precious stone. We follow him. And so then, to finish, we thank God for the message of the gospel of grace. It's there for us to defend and to treasure we thank God for everything that he makes possible through the gospel of grace, salvation in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.